Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, we're looking at the first 16 verses. We got started on it last week, kind of lay the groundwork, some background information, a little bit more of that this morning before we actually get into the text, but basically dealing with the woman's head covering, which has always been controversial among our brethren. Uh, you go down a little further south down into Alabama and you'll find congregations where a good number of the ladies will wear them and you'll go in, about half the ladies will have them on, half of them won't. Uh, as long as these are all kept as matters of personal conviction, uh, we don't have any issue, but sometimes they're pushed to the division, to the dividing asunder of brethren. And the passage is difficult enough, as, and I think we established that last week going through the different viewpoints, it's difficult enough to nail down uh, that what we need to do is kind of figure out what we each believe individually about it and leave it at that because it's, it's just very hard to just kind of get it nailed down completely 100%. But we were looking at uh, last week when we left off the comparison between 1 Timothy 2 uh, and 1 Corinthians 11 because I think to me that kind of settles the matter in my mind anyway. It may not in yours. But in my mind, it kind of settles the matter when you compare the two passages because they're very similar. They are rooted in the headship of man over woman, both passages, the headship of man over woman. Uh, both passages have to do with praying or teaching or praying or prophesying. Both passages use the exact same argument, but in one passage, the women are doing the same thing as the men, and the men in the other passage are the only ones doing anything. So I think to me, that kind of settles it in my mind as to the difference here and what's going on. But just to kind of review, in, in 1, Timothy, or 1 Corinthians 11, both the men and women were praying and prophesying. They're both doing the same thing. You don't have men praying and prophesying, women sitting there listening. That's not what's going on. Whatever the man was doing, the woman was doing. So they were doing exactly the same thing. Over on the other side, though, on 1 Timothy 2, only the men are authorized to pray or teach. Look at the difference in the language there. Pray, prophesy, pray, teach. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, you go a little further, in 1 Corinthians 11, the women must be covered. There's no doubt about that. If you just read the text with an unbiased mind, there's no doubt that the woman has to be covered uh, in 1 Corinthians 11. And 1 Timothy 2, no mention of the covering. Uh, he talks about braided hair, gold, jewels, costly clothing, but no mention of the covering. And that would seem to me to be kind of odd in a passage like that, uh, where it's talking about the relationship of men and women. A uh, man being head over woman, it, it seems odd he wouldn't mention the covering there. Both of them use exactly the same argument to be, base their viewpoint. Uh, the instruction about the head covering is based upon the order of creation. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. That's rooted uh, in the creation that the woman was made from the man and for the man. Uh, so the argument is rooted in creation. Same thing in 1 Timothy 2. A woman is not to teach or have authority over the man because Adam was made first and then Eve. So they're using exactly the same argument. And yet the passages are different because on this side of the equation, women are doing the same thing as the men. On that side of the equation, only the men are allowed to act in terms of praying or teaching. And the only difference I can come up with, in my mind, is that one is inspired and the other is uninspired. And if that is not the difference between the two passages, I'm at a loss to know what it is. Uh, and so that kind of settles it in my mind as to what 1 Corinthians 11 is dealing with. Um, let's kind of expand on that view a little bit. This is the view that I take, that it's limited to inspired women. Uh, we don't have inspired women today, and so the covering would have no application today for us. Uh, but you look at the past, you look at the text. Paul limits the covering, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. Every woman, no, every woman who prays or prophesies. That's what the text says. It doesn't say every woman, it says every woman who prays or prophesies. If you're not praying or prophesying, this doesn't apply to you. So that, that seems to be pretty clear. At least this view has the benefit of taking Paul at his word. That's what he said. Secondly, the context, I think, demands that these men and women be together. You know, we talked about last week, a woman can take a group of children off into a little room over there and teach them the Bible, and nobody jumps up and down about 1 Timothy 2. Why? Because there is no man in that classroom. <laughs> 
That's why she can take the children back there and teach them. There's no man back there. And so she, she's not usurping authority over any man. Same thing here. If there's no man present, why would a woman have to cover her head? It doesn't make any sense. So clearly, it seems to me that the men and women would be together in this situation. Uh, we talked about this last week. Prophesying is speaking. There's no way around that. The women were speaking. There's no way around that. Uh, that's what the text says, flat out. Uh, to prophesy is to speak. But it's not just any kind of speaking, but it's inspired speech. We don't have prophets today. When I'm standing up here, I'm not prophesying. I'm teaching. And there's a difference. I'm not inspired by the Lord. Uh, so prophesying is speaking. And so I submit to you that if they could speak in prophecy, they could speak in prayer. If not, why not? <laughs> it, it, you, so there's, there, I don't think there's any way around that either. If they could speak in prophecy, which they clearly did, then they could speak in prayer. And someone says, well, show me an example of inspired prayer. Well, how about 1 Corinthians 14, just coming over a couple of chapters here. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 14. He says, if I pray in a tongue, what, what does he mean, pray in a tongue? A tongue is a foreign language, and tongues in the Bible, the gift of tongues had to do with something given to you by God. It was a miraculous gift. The only way you could pray in a tongue is if you're inspired. So that, that requires inspiration. To pray in a tongue would require inspiration. Uh, so there's an example of an inspired prayer. By the way, there's all kinds of inspired prayers in the Psalms. How about Psalm 16? If I ever get my Bible over there. And we're familiar with Psalm 16, particularly verses 9 and 10, because this is a prophecy of the Christ. Therefore my heart is glad, Psalm 16, 9, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh will rest in hope for you. He's talking to God, this is a prayer. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So this is a prayer, and it's inspired. So inspired prayers do exist. There is such a thing as inspired prayer. How about Psalm 22? The entire psalm uh, is talking about the crucifixion. It has an immediate application to David in his day, but like so many prophecies, it can only find its ultimate fulfillment, is full, complete fulfillment in the Messiah. And so it starts off in verse 1, my God, my God, it's a prayer. And was this prayer inspired? It most certainly was. David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when people say there's no such thing as inspired prayer, they don't know what they're talking about. Of course there's inspired prayers. There's all kinds of them. Uh, you can find them in the Psalms. Uh, you can find them in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, where they're prayed in a tongue. That would require the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, there is such a thing as inspired prayers. Uh, and to deny that is to deny the, the facts, to deny the scriptures. And so I'm building my case here toward my viewpoint. And again, you don't have to take my viewpoint. You could believe in the custom view if you want to. You can believe that the hair is the covering if you want to. We're not going to argue about it. I don't care. You can believe whatever you want about it. This is what I believe. Okay. Now, let's go a little further. Yes. You know, it says in there to uh, wait. We do is shake hands. Uh -huh. It says in there to greet one another with the only kiss. Yeah. Well, if you're not doing that, I mean, you know, we have a custom of shaking hands. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, a lot of people make that argument, that, and that's a fair argument. It is a fair argument, just like the uh, holy kiss and it was a custom. That's the way they greet, and they still do that to this day. They greet each other with a kiss. I don't kiss any of y'all, except, except one, and she's in the classroom right now. <laughs> but that's the way they greet each other, and Paul said holy kiss. In other words, it needs to be consistent with your Christianity. It's not a kiss of passion. You know, you're not trying to steal a kiss from some other woman. It, and, and in fact, in Bible times, the men kiss the men, ew, and the women kiss the women. That's the way the kiss was done, the kiss of greeting. And you see that on TV all the time. You'll see the tapes of people over there. Uh, and that's what they, they'll greet each other that way. And, and so some people will liken that unto the head covering. And, you know, that's a fair argument. 
I, I just think there's more to it than that in my, in my own viewpoint. But yeah, I like, I mean, nothing wrong with what you said. Therefore, you just choose one. If you're going to go by custom, you can't just pick one and go with it. Yeah, you yeah. Have to go by all yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't kiss each other today because it's not the custom. And that's the way the, the custom view on the cover goes. It was binding for them because it was their custom, but it's not binding today because it's not our custom to wear a head covering. That's the way that argument goes. Yeah. Probably if you're going to observe a kiss custom, you'd need to wash feet too. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that is another custom, the washing of feet. Exactly right. Um, a little bit more information here. Um, the men and women, and I've said this over and over, but I'm just trying to get you to make sure you get this. The men and women were doing the same thing. Both were speaking. It's not men speaking and women being silent. That's not what's going on in 1 Corinthians 11. Obviously, then, they're an exception to the rule. Seems to me pretty clear. Because the rule in 1 Timothy 2, let the men pray in every place. It is the men who leads the prayer. I've never seen anybody get up here uh, like Aaron did and call on uh, a woman to lead prayer. Well, after we get done singing this song, Tony will read the scripture and we'll ask uh, uh, Lisa to lead the prayer. Nobody ever does it. Why? Because it's not allowed. It's not, in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. And in verse 12, I don't allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. So it's, it's always Lanny getting in the pulpit or Aaron or somebody like that. It's always a male and not a female. Because that's the rule today. So I'm arguing here that these inspired women were an exception to the rule. God gave them the ability to prophesy and therefore allowed them to exercise that gift with the provision that they cover their heads. Why? To show submission. You're doing something you're not normally allowed to do, but you still need to recognize your place. So you would have to cover your head. And, and this is the argument that I make. Again, you don't have to accept that argument. That's the <coughs> argument I make. Um, the head covering showed submission in such unusual circumstances. It was not normal for women to be public speakers. But under these circumstances, they could do so provided they covered their heads. Um, and today, fast forward, there are no women who are prophesying. No women who are praying inspired prayers. Since that's true, we don't have any requirement for the head cover. Ergo, it's not binding. And when you look at the, we went through over the four views last week. When you look at all four views, three of the four end up where the covering is not binding. Okay, the artificial covering. If, if, if someone believes that the covering is the hair, then they wouldn't bind an artificial covering. If someone believes the covering was a custom, and we don't have that custom, they wouldn't bind the cover. Uh, if, if someone uh, believed, what was the uh, what was the third one? Oh, the one I just put up there. If someone believes it was just for inspired women, then we wouldn't wear the covering today. Three of the four views end up with the covering not being binding today. Yes? <clears throat> Do we know that it says in here anywhere that they was, the women was even preaching to men again? Well, right there in the verse. I mean, they were preaching and prophesying, but that. Well, they were prophesying. That's that's preaching under inspiration, is what it is. Right, but I'm just saying, we know we don't know for sure that men was in presence when they were doing that. Well, if they weren't, then there would be no need for the head coat. The whole point was to show submission when they're when they're they're both doing the same thing, and the whole point was to show if there's just women with women, there would be no reason to show submission to the man. That's, that's what I'm trying to drive at. Yes, Sylvia. I guess we also have to remember that the gospel just got started. And God was using everybody that was a godly person, and he used them as a tool. And since there weren't enough people around that were, maybe, maybe they weren't as godly as he wanted them to or yeah. whatever, he had to use whoever was qualified to do that. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, he would, he would use whoever he could use. And it was a matter of prophecy, too. It was, you know, I will pour out my spirit on your men servants and on your maid servants. So it was, God said that that would be happening uh, back in the Old Testament. But three of the four views end up with at the same place. The covering's not binding. The, the, the only, there's only one of the four views that says it's binding today. And I think when you remember, we went over that. 
It doesn't say every woman who sits in an assembly, listens to a sermon, sings psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, lays by in store, must cover her head. It just simply doesn't say that. Now, the best argument the, the covering guy can make from the text is that every woman who prays has to cover her head. That's, that's the best argument he can make. He can't take it beyond that. Because we don't have any prophets today. And I've seen that. I went to a congregation down in Alabama one time where a woman laid the head covering on her shoulder all through the service, but when it came time to pray, she would pull it up. 1 Corinthians 11. She'd take it off every other time, everything else we did, but when it came time to pray, she would pull it up. At least she's consistent. You know, you've you got to give her that. And I think, in my judgment, that's the best argument that can be made for binding the covering. And I, and I, I don't think it is enough. I don't, in my mind, it's not enough, but I, that's the best argument that can be made, yes. There's no prophesying today, but right. there's no inspired prayers either today. Right. And that's my argument. That there's no, because he's talking about inspired prayer. They, sometimes they quibble about, I don't know if the prayer was inspired or not. How do you prove that it's inspired? And, you know, you could go back and forth on that from now to Judgment Day and, and never satisfy everybody uh, on that. So, but what my point is, I don't think they're right, but the best they can do is every woman who prays, because that's what it says. That's the best they can do. Uh, but, and so I think this view is the, has the least number of difficulties with it. They all have difficulties. They all have difficulties, you know. Is the prayer inspired? Can I actually prove that 100%? No, I can't prove it 100%, but I think the context lends itself in that way. Um, so, to me, this one has the least number of difficulties. But again, you're going to have to kind of study this on your own, figure out what you believe about it. That's how tough this verse is. Were you going to say something, Joanna? But, you know, we even couldn't say that praying uh, that women would need to because the women are not leading in prayer. Right. See, that, yes, see, exactly. So, so why, would we, why would we need to do that any more than when we sing? Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about we're, we're both we're doing the same thing. Yeah. We're, we're, I mean, we're singing, but we're actually yeah. singing, but praying, we're we're not leading the prayer. Leading we the are prayer. just following along yes. in our minds. And, and, and so the covering wouldn't be needed. At least that's the way I see it, too. I agree with you on that. I think that's correct. Um, let's see if I've got anything. One more uh, slide I want to show you, then we'll get into the text. But Praying and prophesying are linked a lot in Scripture. Uh, and I just, and we're not going to look at all these passages, but you might take a peek at them later. But Abraham was a prophet, and uh, when, uh, who was the guy? Abimelech tried to take his wife. He didn't know she was married to Abraham. And uh, God said, you better not take this man's wife. And, and so he, and, and he was told in Genesis 20, he is a prophet and he will pray for you. And that links prayer and prophecy. Uh, Psalm 1610, we looked at earlier, Psalm 22, both of those are prayers which are also prophecies of the Messiah. Uh, in Luke 2, Simeon prayed and prophesied. Uh, in Luke 2, later on, Anna was a prophetess who continued in prayer in the temple. Uh, in Acts 13, there were prophets in Antioch who were praying. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, women who pray or prophesy, and also men in that verse, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, praying in a tongue or prophesying in that context. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, pray without ceasing, don't despise prophecies. And, so, and all I'm doing there is just showing you that sometimes, not always, but many times praying and prophesying are linked together in Scripture. They, they, they kind of have a connection uh, to an extent. All right, that's the background. Now we'll kind of get into the text itself and see if we can uh, use what we've learned here uh, and try and understand what's being said. The paragraph begins in verse 2. Verse 1 actually is the tail end of chapter 10. When he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, he's talking about the tail end of chapter 10. If you have a paragraph Bible, it'll show that. Uh, but in verse 2 is the beginning of the text. It goes down to verse 16. Verse 2, some commendation or praise. Okay, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. The word tradition here is, is, is talking about 
apostolic traditions. It's, it's parallel to uh, 2 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter 2, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, where Paul says, Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught whether by word or our epistle. Those are apostolic traditions, and that's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 11. I praise you for keeping the traditions as I delivered them to you. Uh, and we still keep those traditions today. The Lord's Supper, we traditionally do that every first day of the week. Laying by in store, we traditionally do that every first day of the week. Why? Because it came down from the apostles. So there are inspired traditions and there are human traditions. God's traditions are binding. Human traditions are not. Okay, because they come from men. Uh, so he's praising them for keeping the traditions. They're doing exactly what he wanted them to do. But, verse 3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Here he sets up a hierarchy, uh, an order of authority. And at the top of the heap is God the Father. Beneath him is Christ. Beneath Christ is Man and beneath man is the woman. So that's the hierarchy. God, Christ, man, woman. Now immediately women say, well that makes me inferior. Well, does it make Christ inferior? Christ is subject to God. Is he inferior to God? No, he is God. He's, he is not the father, but he is deity. So it no more makes woman inferior to man than it makes Christ inferior to God. That, that's nonsense. That's just a hierarchy or order of authority. And it's on this basis that the rest of, the, of the, these verses are built. This is the basis upon which, and what he's basically saying is, I need to explain to you why. The problem wasn't whether they wore it or not. They were wearing it. Verse 2 says you're keeping the traditions that I gave to you. That's great. Now I want to explain to you the reasoning behind it, verse 3. Here's why I gave these traditions about the head covering. Okay. And notice that head, how it's used in verse 3. The head of every man. What does he mean by the head of every man is Christ? What's the head? Authority. That's the authority, yeah. But then he, tell you, he goes off talking about this head. And so there, therein lies another point of confusion. When is he talking about this head? And when is he talking about authority head, see? So you, you, you kind of you can get in, you can meet yourself coming and going there if you're not careful. But verse 3, clearly talking about the authority structure. God, Christ, man, woman. And so, verse 4, here's the application, verses 4 and 5. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head uncovered. What head's uncovered? This head? It says covered. Our head. Uh, it's covered. It's covered. I'm sorry, but which head is covered? You're right, which head is covered? Is this head? Yes. Yeah, it's this head. But then he says, dishonors his head. What head is he dishonoring? Christ. Christ, see. And see, there's the dual use of head. That's what I wanted you to see. And if that's not true, then verse 3 doesn't fit. The only way to make verse 3 fit in the context is to understand that the man who has his head covered dishonors his head, being Christ. He dishonors Christ. Not this head he dishonors. It's this head he uncovers, or covers, but... It, the head that he dishonors is Christ. That links you back to verse 3, see. That's the very foundation of the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I got myself in trouble with that one time when I moved over to uh, Burstall. They used to have this family reunion down on, uh, well, I forget which creek it was. But I went down there. And I don't often wear a hat, but every once in a while I do, and I grab a ball cap and put it on. And I didn't think anything about it. And they asked me to leave the prayer. Well, I let the prayer have my ball cap on. So the next Sunday on the radio, here comes the question. What do you think about a Church of Christ preacher who prays with his hat on? <laughs> so I was like, ah. Uh, frankly, I don't think it's, that's just a custom. But that's, that's exactly, that's where that comes from. It's, you know, when a man walks in a building, usually he'll take his hat off. And when a man prays, a lot of times he'll take his hat off. And sometimes they'll tie it to this passage. I don't think this passage is talking about that. But you can see where that, and that's why everybody got upset. Well, you're a Church of Christ preacher praying with his hat on. I don't think I sinned. But I gave my explanation about it. Yeah, yeah, they say, yeah, they say it's because of custom. 
the, you should take it off. And of course, the reason I did it is because I didn't even think about having it on. I hardly ever wear it on. So I had it on, and I, don't, I didn't think about the etiquette of it at all. I just never crossed my mind. Uh, but, you know, boy, I got criticized for that. <laughs> but uh, verse 5, then, the opposite. Every woman who prays or prophesies. So now she's noticed she's, whatever he's doing, she's doing. They're both doing the same thing. Except that the man has his head covered. Yeah, if he does it covered, he dishonors his head. If the woman does it uncovered, she dishonors her head. Who's she dishonoring? Is she dishonoring this head? Or is she dishonoring the man? The man is her head. So she's dishonoring the man. The man is dishonoring Christ. See, the head of man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. She's dishonoring her head, the man. She's dishonoring her, her man. So if you look at the verse, then what is the man supposed to do? Uncover his head, because if he covers his head, he dishonors Christ. And the woman is supposed to cover her head, because if she uncovers it, she dishonors the man. See? But notice that dual use of head there. That's, that's another point of confusion there. It's your head in terms of authority, and then there's this head that's covered or not covered. So you, 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 can, you can really kind of get confused there if you don't stay with it. Now, verse, the last part of verse 5. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she takes the covering off. She dishonors her head, the man, for because that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Now, look at that for just a second. That's something that doesn't ring true in our minds for some reason. Because it's geared to their societal mores. The only way to know the significance of a shaved head is by societal mores. Uh, and he's saying it's one and the same as if her head was shaved. In that culture, a shaven-headed woman was signifying her independence. That's the clear implication of the context here. It's the same thing as if she shaved her head. And everybody goes, oh, she shaved her head. She's not listening to anybody. She's not subject to her husband. She's not subject to man. So one and the same as if her head was shaved. And he's trying to, to in, in, incite within them the, the, the shame of that. That this is an act of rebellion. If a woman prophesied with her head uncovered, it was an act of rebellion just like a woman who shaved her head. Trying to show independence here from the man. So verse 6, if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. Now, notice the word also. Well, we went over this earlier, I think it was last week. That tells you that the covering is not just the hair. If she's not covered, her hair is cut off, then let her also cut her hair off. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So... The covering is an artificial covering. So if the woman's not going to wear an artificial covering, she may as well shave her head. She's just as bad as the, as the woman who doesn't have her hair long, doesn't have her hair uh, in the proper length. She's in the same category, a rebel, rebelling against authority. Uh, so if she's not covered, let her be shorn. But if it's shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, now notice the difference there, not not. Shorn is cut, shaved is shaved off. So if it's shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, then let her be covered. So he's drawing an argument there. He's saying one is just as bad as the other. If she's not going to wear the artificial covering when she prays or prophesies, she may as well go all the way and just shave her head or at least cut it off short. Now, let's fast forward to our day for a second as we think about this. How long is long? A woman ought to have long hair. Get down and play with the test. How long is long? I look around the room. Your hair is not long. 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 How long is long? And that other that other covering. We brought that out a couple of weeks ago, last week. That other covering is more akin to custom, isn't it? And if, if we're not, if we're going to make it a law, then we better decide how long is long and how short is short. Because we got a lot of short-haired women in this room. And my argument is, 
A hair length is a matter of custom. It's not a matter of divine law. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I had long hair. And I probably could show you a picture on our phone. I had long hair. And I didn't feel a bit ashamed. Because that was the way it was in my day. Men wore long hair. That was the way it was in my day. I didn't feel a bit ashamed. So this nat nature, we get down here in verse 13, does not nature teach? This is custom. He's talking about their custom, their social mores. Hair length has always been a matter of custom. Um, in Jesus' day, most Jewish men had long hair. I know that probably throws a lot of people off, but that's just a fact. When you go digging into it, most Jewish men had long hair, and most Jewish men had beards. And societally, those things have always gone in cycles. There have been times when men were clean shaven. I remember those days. And there have been times when men were not necessarily clean shaven. Sometimes they wore mustaches or beards. And, and uh, there have been times when men had short hair. My dad's favorite haircut was a flat top. He loved his. He loved to have a flat top, and that was that was slick looking. And it, you know that was the way they wore back then. But then came the '60s, and that all changed. And, and those things have always changed historically, up and down. Those have always been matters of custom. Uh, even in the Bible, the Nazarite vow. Let's take a look at that real quick. I think it's I think it's number six, if I remember right. It might be Leviticus six, but I think it's number six. This was a vow you took to God. And, yeah, Numbers, number 6, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say, Now look at the language, When either a man or a woman, either one, consecrates an offering to take the vow of the Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink, he shall drink neither vinegar made from wine or vinegar made from similar drink. He shall, drink, he shall not drink any grape juice or eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation no razor shall come upon his head. Both men and women had long hair. Men had it too. Okay. At the end of the vow, when we come down here to verse... Uh, Eight, I think it is. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. If anyone dies very suddenly beside him, he defiles his consecrated head. He shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. And on the seventh day, he'll shave it. On the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves, two young pigeons to the priest. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering, one as a burnt offering. I'm, I'm not far enough down. Oh, verse 13. That's what I was looking for. I, I didn't go down far enough. This is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled... He shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in his first year as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in his first year without blemish as a sin offering, one ram without blemish as a peace offering. Uh, read on down here to verse, I get, I get it here in a second, 18. Then the Nazarite, who could be Nazarites? Men and women. Then the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head. So look at that passage. By the command of God, you got both men and women with long hair. By the command of God, you got both men and women shaving their heads at the end of that consecration. So this isn't a moral issue. Long hair and short hair is not a moral issue at all. If it was, God wouldn't have commanded the women to shave their heads at the end of their vow, and he wouldn't have commanded the men to grow their hair long. So this long hair, short hair is nothing but a custom. It always has been. And those things have gone up and down in cycles all through history. Always, uh, always have done that. Uh, but sometimes we don't think about that. We just zero in on one verse. Well, a man's supposed to have short hair, one's supposed to have long hair. Sounds real good until you start digging into it, like we did there with number six. And you start digging into it, and you find out that's not a universal rule. It's not always that way. And then you got the problem of defining how long is long and how short is short. So that, that runs into all kinds of problems when you start trying to bind hair lengths on people. Uh, and, and so I would, I would recommend against it because uh, you're just going to have nothing but controversy over it. All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. I just got a couple of minutes here. We clearly won't get finished with the text this morning, but that's all right. Um, 
Verse 6, if a woman is not covered, now when she's supposed to be covered, by the way, don't forget that. When she's she's praying and prophesying. If a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it's shameful for a woman to to be shorn or shaved, let her also be covered. And then verse 7, he goes into the reason why. For a man ought not, that's moral imperative, ought not cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. The man is not from the woman, but the woman from the man. She was taken from his side, Mary in Genesis, made from the rib of Adam. Nor was man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the woman was created for the man. For this reason, the things I just stated there in verse 7, 8, and 9, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now I want to see if I can squeeze in this symbol of authority real quick before we run out of time. Symbol of authority. Think for a second. Notice he didn't say a symbol of submission. A symbol of authority. Look at a king's crown. That crown is a symbol of authority. Whose authority? His. His, the one who wears it. And this head covering was a symbol of authority. Her authority to do what? To pray or to prophesy. This gave her the authority. If she put that on, she had the, it was a symbol of her authority to pray or prophesy. She could exercise that gift if she put that on. That symbolized her authority to do what she was not normally allowed to do. It gave, it gave her the authority to do that. And I'm out of time. So I probably generated a whole bunch of questions. Write them down, bring them back next week, and we'll see if we can answer them. We'll try.